Uh, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our session this morning on liberal education and American democracy. I'm Charlie Thomas. Uh, let me add my voice to the, it's too big to be a, a chorus anymore, the grand choir of people uh, um, lauding this event. Um, it's been wonderful so far and really looking forward to today, including our session this morning. Um, as chair of the session, I'm just sort of a uh, uh, traffic cop. I will be slipping uh, these gentlemen notes when they're getting close to time and they will be ignoring me. Uh, and we will still try to, uh, to try to get through this session. Um, but the, the general pattern will be this. Uh, I'll introduce one of our speakers at a time, but we will save all of the Q&A to the end after all three have, have had an opportunity to speak. And before we open uh, the Q&A to the floor, um, Lisa Von Boxel will uh, be offering some synoptic comments on the three papers to, uh, to get us started as the moderator of the session. So first, uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, John Agresto, um, well known to everyone, I think, probably in this room, uh, former president of St. John's College, and his, uh, Santa Fe, and his talk is entitled, Do the Liberal Arts Today Serve Any Useful Public Function? John Agresto. Not only that they and their children want to get a good job and make lots of money, 
I often want to make a contribution more generally to the world, to do something useful for themselves and their neighbors, even their country, and they don't see what use the liberal arts are, either the more traditional or especially in the newer formulations, what use the liberal arts are either to themselves or to society. Now we know that talking about the usefulness uh, gives most liberal artists the willies. We in the liberal arts are always more comfortable with divorcing ourselves from utility, with seeing our enterprise as something higher than training people in the more useful arts or helping people gain a living. Now my point is not to convince you of the worthiness of other forms of education, though I know that I tend to see them as more worthy than many of my colleagues do. And my point is definitely not to tell you that today's liberal education needs to adopt a rhetoric of usefulness to deceive the public into thinking we're something we are not. <laughs> uh, my point, it doesn't matter. Uh, my point is simply that the liberal arts are, when at their best, not only of immense value, that's the insight of use, not only for each of us as individuals, but I think also, and especially, of use to society at large. Let me go back to the first years of this country. I'm reminded of the famous phrase of John Witherspoon, an early president of what would later become Princeton University, who said to his students that they should not, quote, live useless and die contemptible. I used to say things like that when I was president, too. <laughs> uh, to Witherspoon, to go to college and not draw from it some things, many things, of use to oneself and to the world at large would have surely seemed quite strange. And recognizing that among those who went to Princeton and listened to President Witherspoon were nine future cabinet members, 12 governors, 21 senators, 39 congressmen, three Supreme Court justices, a vice president, and a president. James Madison, who was also one of five of Witherspoon's students at the Constitutional Convention, I can only assume that the good Mr. Witherspoon thought it was particularly contemptible to be useless in the public realm, not just intellectual, not just ineffectual in our private lives. Now, part of the reason why I'm troubled by the way liberal education seems always ready to denigrate other forms of education or to criticize society at large for our problems is that in trying to shun the blame elsewhere, we absolve ourselves too easily for our own decline. We have worn what we saw as our purity and inutility as a badge. When students turned away from us, we too often said it was their fault, that they were more interested in jobs and money and money making than in education. We blamed cushy parents for the materialism of modern life or the rise, as this conference's brochure mentions, of consumerism. Yes, we should be furious over the coming death of the liberal arts in America. But we should examine ourselves, and by ourselves I do not mean St. John's in particular, but the enterprise of liberal education at large, and be honest with ourselves. And having come to grips with all the causes of our recent decline, we might again begin, we might begin to see that the death of the liberal arts is less a murder than a suicide. We all know how the liberal arts have marginalized themselves out of existence. We read the course, read course, the course catalogs of so many colleges and see how, for instance, departments of literature have become shells of their former selves. With the rise of graduate school analysis and specialization that is now so much a part of the undergraduate curriculum, how much vitality has been lost from literature? Gone today in too many places are all the stories that show us the world with its joys and sorrows. Gone all are marveling over the varieties of human types or stories of honor and treachery, of hopes ascendant and hopes dashed. Or replaced by more ideological driven studies or replaced with our contemporary infatuation with race, class, and politics. Too many history departments stopped trying to show us all that we could learn from the past and began to think it best to show us all we couldn't learn from the past. 
After all, to take one example, if the founders of this country of ours were little more than white racist slaveholders who set up a government in order to line their pockets and protect their interests, who in his right mind would want to waste his time and his parents' money to study the founding period seriously? Looking over the liberal arts, I'm not sure which of the many isms of today has done the most damage. Is it the relativism and postmodernism that we fought so furiously over in the 80s? Or is it the ideology of multiculturalism, which promised to expand greatly our worldview, but instead narrowed it mortally by making us ashamed to take seriously the works of dead born European males? Is it the remnants of a kind of pop Marxism, which always has us look for economic and material causes as the source of human motivation, and thus diminishes what used to be seen as the sovereign power of arguments, thoughts, and ideas? Is it the rise of an ideology of critical thinking that passes itself off as the core of the liberal activity, but sadly spends more of its time being critical than being thoughtful? Or is it, as I just mentioned before, the rise of the specialization of graduate schools, which specialization has been the engine of progress in many of the advanced sciences and technology, but the cause of so much smallness of both mind and vision in the humanities? Let me stay on specialization for a second. How clearly I remember teaching at other reputable liberal arts colleges where the best undergraduates would tell me they wanted to double major, triple major. Why? Because even they knew that what they were getting was too narrow, too small, too particularized and specialized to satisfy them. Maybe if they say double major, they could see more. Sadly, as too many of them found out, only rarely did double majoring expand anything, or for the men closing oneself more from all else that should be learned. Still, not, uh, nevertheless, you see students generally are not the problem. The best of them do want, and what I've heard you are a wealthy once said, want to see the world and see it whole. Not see it all. Right? Even they know no one can ever see it all. But so many of them do want to see it whole. See it, see it in its interconnections, see the relationship between causes and effects, thought and act, act consequence between love and jealousy, jealousy and revenge, revenge and justice, justice and all other human goods. They have the vague sense that the universe is actually the cosmos, not a jumble of isolated and discrete unrelated items, but a web of relationships where one insight leads to another, where one answer leads to another answer. Again, it's not students who are the problem. They have the same questions they've always had. Some have questions that revolve around culture and art. Others have questions about the natural world or about the animal kingdom and why they are the way they are. Almost all have moral questions. What is just? What makes something worthy? What do I owe others? What do others owe me? Now that said, I do not believe that students are necessarily interested in having questions piled on top of questions in some endless stream of doubt. Uh, you think you have questions. Where do you see the questions I have for you, the tutor in things? And where do you see this way to this guy Socrates confronts you? Well, there'll be a, there'll be a bazillion questions then. If all you have are questions, intriguing as they may be, not many students will be interested. Even Socrates, with all his questioning, still wanted to know the answers. Still, I admit the opposite is worse. To say that the liberal arts and we ever so humane humanists have not only all the questions, but all the answers. Answers that we will preach to you on every topic from the evils of capitalism to the foolishness of religious beliefs to the meaning of social justice. Well, having all the answers into which we instruct our students may well be the most corrupting and prevalent of contemporary academic inputs. On many campuses, how often is it the non-liberal studies that open up students' minds, while the humanities and their practitioners seem more intent on preaching and converting than on opening and liberating? And what parent in their right, what parents in their right minds would want to spend fifty thousand a year for that? 
So where does liberal education go from here? I'm especially interested in the issue I raised at the start, the question I so inelegantly framed in terms of use. Where do we go to show once again that the liberal arts can be of use to us as individuals and of benefit again to the society as a whole? First, as I've said already too often, let's stop denigrating the non-liberal arts and stop questioning the motives of those who look to pursue them. We do not build ourselves up by tearing down other worthy modes of education. Was Jefferson any less intelligent, any less human or less humane, having been an architect and a farmer, as well as a philosopher and a political scientist? Second, let's do what we can to help our students see what the important questions are and what the variety of important answers might be. Not what our answer is, not what the answer of the supposedly more just or sensitive or socially aware people are, but what the range and scope of all serious answers might be. Third, let's put aside all the overblown platitudes and flowery banalities about ourselves. How we educate the whole man, how we feed the spirit and elevate the soul, or how we are the ones who really teach people how to think, or how we are the source and font of ever so much humane and ethical instruction. Okay. If overblown hoo-ha is not what we should be chasing, what should we be doing? What actually is the peculiar excellence of the liberal arts that we should present to prospective students and their parents? Let me cite a modest statement by John Henry Newman. The liberal arts are that great but ordinary means to a great but ordinary end. What ordinary but great things might he be talking about? How about learning how to read? Read? What an ordinary thing, you say. Yes, but when you read carefully and, and, and sympathetically, again, not exactly critically, but sympathetically, you open the door to an amazing thing. You open the door to another person's mind. You have the ability to do a truly great thing from this ordinary thing. You now have the ability to possess another's thoughts. It's truly marvelous. We humans may want somebody else's beauty or strength. We may want somebody else's physical, uh, uh, something physical and bodily, but we can't. We can never really possess someone else's material body, even with the best of medical science at our disposal. We can have part of him that's not material. We can possess someone else's mind. Jefferson's body may be a moldering of the grave. But his mind can still live in ours. His mind, his ideas, and reasons can live forever in us because he wrote and we learned how to read. What else? Well, as I said before, one of the best things about adolescence is that most of them are looking for answers to their deepest questions. Questions about love and justice, happiness, desire, nature, and its workings. Again, great but ordinary matters. But this means, I believe, so long as we can reinvigorate real literature, real philosophy, real historical and biographical studies that truly try to understand rather than debug the past, real inquiry into the fine arts with serious inquiries into the beautiful and the sublime, and solid mathematics and science, all of that gets me well. But this means reviving an older view of liberal education. I was recently reminded, not by John Henry Newman, but by Joseph Pieper, uh, of a sentence in uh, Aquinas' commentary on Aristotle's metaphysics. That sounds kind of esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not. The statement goes like this. The philosopher and the poet have this in common. They both begin by marvel. The liberal arts do not begin in doubt, not even exactly in questioning, but simply in wonder, in marveling. We begin as Miranda, the marveling one did, not with being critics of the world, but by being simply overwhelmed with the wonder of the world. From there, all our questions flow. Why are things, are, why are things the way they are? Why is the universe as it is? What are people really like? 
what am I to do? Again, all great, but in a real way, all ordinary matters. To begin here with wonder is perhaps to start in answering the first part of what we see. What is the use of Olegoro's education for me, for the individual? In this account, the first benefit of it is that it begins to satisfy the human craving to know, to have insights into serious and insight into serious answers to our most serious questions, perhaps even to see the world and see it whole when that longing in us is most alive. Does this education have any more outwardly useful or practical import for us as individuals? Yes, it does. Again. Culture to everyone. 
While other parts of university education might be progressive and forward-looking, the liberal arts had no hesitation in looking backward. It understood it had a conserving function to play. It preserved for everyone, not just the elites, beautiful music, fine art, high culture, fabulous literature, good poetry. In this regard, it wasn't a shame to be Western or even Eurocentric. Indeed, it had a kind of honest pride in being the caretakers of such wonderful treasures, hard treasures, hard treasures. Liberal education once knew that its keeping the culture alive was actually one of the most publicly useful things it could do. It gave beauty and intelligence, tone and cultivation, as Newman says, to the whole society. In this way, the liberal arts were for more than simply the enjoyment of a few lucky students or the domain of the rich and well born. They were the gift the liberal arts gave to everyone. Back then, the liberal arts didn't feel bad that Dante and Homer were dead white males, nor did we, the children of working men and the grandchildren of immigrant women, uh, feel bad about it either. Back then, in fact, humanists actually thought, and rightly so, that keeping Shakespeare alive was a universal gift, that an ethnocentric act. Having been given such treasures, it's now our turn to repay Shakespeare and Milton, Aristotle, and Madison. So we repay them as best we can by keeping them alive. Their bodies, as I said before, may be dead, but they are. And keeping the words and thoughts of great men and women alive is not only of the highest use for us, both individually and as a society, but an act of repayment, of justice, which of them. Our next speaker is Wilfred McClay, uh, Professor of History and Classics at the University of Oklahoma. Of what the university's appropriate work consisted in. 
and I quote roughly from memory here, the university is the place where the unthinkable can be thought, the unspeakable can be said, the inconceivable can be conceptualized, and the unfashionable can be entertained. For Whitbury, the university again alone offered the world a place consecrated to the most precious and most imperiled aspect of human freedom, our freedom of thought, freedom of inquiry, freedom of expression. Without strong institutional protections for such freedoms against the forces that always seem to spring up against them, we would lose the benefit of them, including the benefits that come of a culture that's bent on seeking and finding the truth without fear or favor. Visibly stirred by his words, the audience applauded loud and long, and I joined them. Then later the day came the second Monday speaker, the political scientist James Q. Wilson, also speaking on the theme of the university's purpose. In his speech, Wilson argued that the modern university was best understood or that the chief concerns were of the rich but fragile civilization of the Western world, the keeper of our intellectual, moral, and artistic treasures, and our collective historical memory. That heritage had made us what and who we are, he said. But our dynamic, commercial, and progressive culture was all too likely to toss that heritage aside in the pell-mell pursuit of the next big thing. If the university did not take care to look after the older things, he asked, who else would? Without a strong institutional commitment to the conservation and propagation of that cultural inheritance, we would lose the benefit of it, including the benefit that comes of sustaining a vital connection to the past and to the best that's been thought and expressed in the human experience. For these words, too, the audience applauded loud and long, and again, I joined them enthusiastically, though by now experiencing a bit of puzzlement at them and at myself. Puzzlement because it struck me that the audience, and I myself, seemed to be applauding with equal gusto two entirely different and incompatible ideals of the university. Woodward seemed to be holding up the university as a place of constant unsettlement, even creative destruction, in which everything that's taken for granted as truth today is open at every moment to being rethought, reframed, reconstituted, and even discarded, a place in which no dogma is safe and no complacency is tolerated place in which ideas and ideals can have validity only so long as they stand up to the intense scrutiny of today's most important question and criticism. Wilson, on the other hand, the second speaker, was pushing for an idea of the university which, which stood precisely against the arrogant and self-absorbed tendency of the modern world to appoint itself the plenipotentiary judge of all things to deny and disparage the authority of all that's come before it, and in so doing, to ensure that those who come after it will accord it the same treatment in the fullness of time. Wilson's university, instead, was a place where the young would be educated to take up the fullness of their cultural inheritance, to become literate and conversant in its many features, and to fully appropriate all that it has to offer them. So these are very different, two very different sounding ideas about the nature of higher education. And yet that day we applauded them both with roughly equivalent fervor. Were we being mindless fools, or merely polite to a fault, or heavily confused in doing so? Or might there be a deeper logic linking them, one that neither speaker sought to illuminate, but that we need to take to heart in our own attempt to understand what the value of a college education, and particularly one of the liberal arts, ought to be in the present day. I think there is, in fact, a deeper sense in which these two different accounts of the university are merely different aspects of the same vision, a vision of education as a preparation for freedom, in the fullest sense of that term. Freedom, not as mere license, Freedom not as a life lived unfettered by constraints or coercions or traditions. Uh, no, 
are not, for that matter, freedom is a life lived in an easygoing, conflict-free adjustment of one's wants to the world as one finds it. But freedom as rational self-government, freedom as a regimen of risks and rewards, freedom grounded in a, in a fruitful combination of membership and inquiry, those two categories I began with, a membership and inquiry, or reverence and criticism, a freedom that releases us from the unquestioned tutelage of the past, but in a way that enables us to draw sustenance from the past rather than aiming to make us disdainful of it. Wilson's university would bring to the stars the blessings of a more fully conscious and informed membership in the society of which they are already a part, while Whitford's university would give them space for inquiry, for questioning, the ability to engage in acts of radical criticism, including civilizational self-criticism, which these represent one of the chief means by which that society, our society, has been induced to improve itself and address its deficiencies. The best university, the one that teaches the liberal arts, needless to say, is the one that does both of these things at the same time. And you were right to applaud both speakers at that convention, for we need both messages. Membership without inquiry is stale traditionalism. Inquiry without membership is captiousness or kindness playing a poker game with no stakes added in the game. The end in view is of substituting informed loyalties for blind ones, substituting conscious reasonableness and uncoerced love for fear and dependency and superstition and reflex. It is a freedom that comes of seeing all that one has formerly known in a larger arena within a larger frame as part of a larger reality, to see it all in, as we say, a new light. That image of seeing all things freshly, when they have been freshly illuminated by the emergence of greater sources of light, will make many of us in this room particularly think of one of the greatest and most imperishable parables of education, Plato's allegory of the cave in the seventh book. You all know the story, a strange, weird tale of people who've been compelled since birth to view images cast upon a wall as if they were the only real things in existence. And of the disturbing revelations that come to them when they're released from their bondage and brought into the blinding light of day, brought to see things as they really are. This same parable, of course, has been related in many ways. In the various understandings of the veil of Maya in Hinduism and Buddhism, or the evil demon in Descartes' meditations who orders the world so as to deceive us, or the 1999 science fiction movie, The Matrix, in which most of humanity has been constrained to experience only a simulation of reality created by all controlling life or even something as familiar to Americans as the movie The Wizard of Oz. What all these narratives reinforce is a powerful and sometimes haunting apprehension that we may be living our lives under the spell of a complete illusion, whether imposed by others or by ourselves, that the process of freeing ourselves from that illusion is painful and unsettling, that it can involve a complete transformation of all that was familiar and a complete redescription of reality itself in the name of the search for truth. And the stakes are very high indeed. Those Illuminati who return to the cave and play those parable, he tells us, are likely to be killed by those Illuminationists. <laughs> <laughs> One has to be open to serendipity. <laughs> Life is not a prepared thing. <laughs> Those Illuminati who return to the cave, which Plato tells us, are likely to be killed by those who have never left the cave and do not want to have their illusions disturbed. Fortunately, reality is rarely so dramatic and extreme as that. 
Plato's great allegory and other versions of this theme are not the whole story about education, which is just as often a tale of delight and discovery as one of pain. I fear that Plato's allegory may mislead us by emphasizing only one part of the effort of liberal education, the part, and that is the part of disabusing and disillusioning, of weakening the stranglehold of the present and the past upon us for the sake of better apprehending the possibilities that beckon from beyond. An argument I find much more helpful and reliable than Plato alone comes from a small book by the late historian Yaroslav Pelikan called The Vindication of Tradition. Drawing upon an essay by Ralph Waldo Emerson, Pelikan offers up a distinction between tradition and insight, and then goes on to show how unsustainable that distinction really is, and forgive me, I'm going to read uh, a, a paragraph from his text. This is Pelican. A leap of progress is not a standing broad jump which begins in the line of where we are now. It is a running broad jump through where we have been to where we go next. The growth of insight and science and the arts and philosophy and theology has not come through progressively sloughing off more and more of tradition as though insight would be purest and deepest when it has finally freed itself of the dead past. It simply does not work that way in the history of the tradition, and it does not work that way now. By including the dead in the circle of discourse, we enrich the quality of the conversation. Of course, we do not only listen to the dead, nor are we, are, nor are we a tape recording of that tradition, but we do acquire the insight for which Emerson when we learn to interact creatively with the tradition that he was denouncing. And Pelican finally concludes his examination with a, a charge to the reader, taken from the very first bow. What you have as heritage, take now as past, for thus you will make it your own. What you have as heritage, take now as past, for thus you will make it your own. In this view, the study, point of studying the tradition is not to absolve us of the need to think for ourselves or relieve us of the responsibility to build things of our own. On the contrary, the tradition helps us to recognize the work we are meant to do. Our heritage is our past. It gives our world its defining contours, its horizons, its specific possibilities, its problems. We cannot know or undertake our task without the benefit of our heritage. But it is by doing our task that we come into full possession of that heritage, thereby perpetuating the tradition of something living, and thereby making it possible for us to have a free and full relationship with that heritage. Like that of children who have fully grown up and can at last see and embrace their parents and their forebears for the people they actually are, and come into fully adult possession of their own inheritance. So the Platonic allegory is not fully adequate to the task here. But then neither is Woodward's description of the university as a relentless and unsparing critique, or Wilson's of the university as an agency of reference, a cultural transmission. What might fit Pelican's description best is the idea of education as a Bildungsroman, or narrative journey. But only if one adds the qualification that it is a narrative journey culminating in a homecoming, the kind of story that we, in this room, call an odyssey. We shall not cease from exploration, wrote T.S. Eliot in the beginning. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place such is the task of liberal education, rightly understood, as a liberating exploration that results not in our being made permanently uprooted and alienated, but in our being more fully at home in the world that we already inhabit, and more fully able to enhance this view of life and nobly and sustain it. An inquiry that draw, draws upon challenges but ultimately affirms and strengthens our sense of membership in that world. In fact, an inquiry whose pursuit is part and 
parcel of our belongings, and which makes tradition and insight into partners rather than foes. The truly wise cosmopolitan knows what Dorothy told us, that there's no place like home. I think the contribution of liberal education to our public life ought to be clear enough from what I've said so far. Of course, I recognize, as does everyone in this conference, that institutions for liberal education are imperiled on all sides by problems of excessive cost and uncertain results. There are hard questions ahead of us about questions of access and economic feasibility and sustainability, practicality, and all these things. And I don't mean to brush these questions aside. But I think that before we make a potentially fatal decision to change forever what we do and adapt to the end to the means or the perceived means, we need to think very hard about what the end of liberal education really is. We live at what is arguably the most prosperous moment in the entire history of the human race. The standard of living that even the most common among us enjoys today would be the envy of kings and queens is it really credible then to say at precisely this moment that the pursuit of the highest and best kind of education is something that much poorer people in times in the past were right to seek, but that we can no longer afford it? Can we hear how absurd it sounds for us to be saying such things? The chief public benefit of liberal education, when it is functioning successfully, is the formation of a particular kind of person, a particular kind of citizen who robustly embodies the virtues of both inquiry and membership, and therefore is equipped for the truth-seeking, deliberation, responsible action that the democratic form of government demands. Such a person has an ability to draw back from the flow of events and reflect upon them, the ability to consult the voice of reason and the wise testimony of the past. Such a person has the cognitive and moral strength to see the world as it is, and not to be fooled into mistaking a succession of images projected onto the walls of caves or conjured onto screens for reality, no matter how large the images or how pervasive their presence, and no matter how many others around them have been gulled or deceived into believing those images. Which is a way of acknowledging that Plato's great allegorical image of liberation remains at the core of education, even if it does not constitute the whole of it. Before we can do anything truly magnificent and lasting, we must be drawn out of our various caves. We must be liberated from the sirens of propaganda or the enchantments of virtual experience before we can accomplish anything worthwhile. One doesn't have to believe that we are inhabiting our own soft core version of the matrix to believe that an unhealthy proportion of our experience, and I'd say particularly the experience of the young, has come to be mediated and directed and channeled and stimulated and stimulated by the artificial instrumentalities we use to apprehend the world. These instrumentalities confine our imaginations to believing in a world that they not we conjure into being. Such a tendency carries with it great danger, both for our ability to think clearly and attentively, and our ability to draw on our imaginations with vividness, intensity, and independence, not to mention unbecoming the patterns of restrained and civil and public deliberation that genuine democratic society needs. In the years to come, it will be a greater and greater part of the genuine liberal education to counteract these less benign effects of our ghostly electronic caves and restore us to ourselves, restore our ability to hear and see and touch the earth for ourselves, to gaze in the night sky for ourselves and bring us back into contact with the exhilarating windswept heights of our human freedom and give us through the hard study of old books and the hard but delightful work of conversation an enduring and unsimulated experience of human excellence.
drink of our own from that reservoir of wisdom of which Herman Melville was speaking when he wrote this genius all over the world stands hand in hand, and one shock of recognition runs the whole world round. That study, that drink, that shock <coughs> constitute our introduction to a profoundly public world, a shared world, the highest common denominator, a world beyond all haze and agencies, and yet a world to which we fully belong. Thank you. Our final speaker in this remarkable panel is uh, Dana Cullen, Professor of Political Science and Liberal Arts at Rhodes College.
but to enable us to do it seriously. And as I say, I agree with these fine insights. I would only emphasize the risk that liberal education faces in our democracy, and also emphasize, therefore, what I take to be the countercultural tendency, the essential tendency of liberal education in democracy. And my argument is that if it is to serve democracy, it can only do so indirectly, which means liberal education turns out to be a negative education, serving democracy by opposing its characteristic tendencies. And that, I think, is what makes it a particularly tough sell today. One tendency of democracy has been to expand higher education, aiming for universal access, but the expansion of knowledge has also brought a narrowing of the objects of study. Anything and everything can be studied, and so specialism proceeds apace. Only the expert has authority, and expertise becomes synonymous with specialization. The result, though, is a waning of the sense of knowledge contributing to the grasp of that ordered whole to which John Agresto alluded. And I think it casts a different light on the spirit of inquiry that Bill identified with the modern university. The latter is free, but primarily in the sense of being open or unordered, beyond the peaceful coexistence of the separate disciplines, there seems to be no ultimate grounding of knowledge or unified aim. One of the urgent issues today concerns whether liberal education can survive the conversion of college education to the research university model, which views knowledge not as an inheritance to be appropriated, but as an endless project of discovery, leading not toward home, but to the next frontier. As James Shaw put it recently, the sciences never know what they might be in the future. In suggesting, then, that liberal education is at risk in democracy, I take my starting point from Aristotle's notion that the shape of a life is determined by what the soul is directed toward. Because human beings pursue a variety of goals, including wealth, pleasure, power, honor, and knowledge, there are different roots of soul formation, and a conflict of opinions favoring the souls turning one way rather than another. And as you know, Aristotle associates the best life with thinking, and links education with freedom from the interferences with thinking, inevitably generated by practical or civic necessities. Those necessities are real. We are not exclusively thinking beings. But education aims at a condition of soul involving a leisured or disinterested detachment from all practical concerns. Which is why I say, wholly unoriginally, that the spirit of liberal education is essentially countercultural, and especially so in a hyper utilitarian society like our own. So reviving that spirit, that spirit today means, I think, heeding the imperative of detachment especially from the otherwise worthy goals of vocational and civic education. I stress, then, the negative or oppositional quality of liberal education only to clarify what the latter is ultimately for. Was that the two-minute warning on that? <laughs> the rhetoric of the commencement address typically lauds liberal education as the best preparation for life. But Aristotle's conception reveals education as life's main activity. The useless character, therefore, of liberal education is at odds with vocationalism or pre-professionalism. Liberal education is also at odds with civic education, their shared affinity for freedom notwithstanding. Although liberal education contributes to the formation of good citizens, it must forswear the goal of instilling civic attachment, which inevitably involves a conditioning incompatible with freedom of the mind. I conclude later with a suggestion derived from Tocqueville on the way in which liberal education, uh, why, which preserving liberal education for its own sake might incidentally fortify democratic freedom. And I'll now just gloss briefly each of these tensions that I've pointed to. In a commercial society, students are not surprisingly inclined toward making a good life by making a good living. 
Most think of their college education as the way to become some sort of professional by getting on a career track, a term that suggests, I think, the narrowness of our educational ambitions. In my experience, students have more than an inkling of the insufficiency of education's career preparation, but having internalized the imperative, they're anxious, which is not to say eager, to get on with it. At the same time, universities are increasingly reluctant to tell them what it means to be liberally educated. And one can measure the bad conscience of an institution on this matter by looking at, or maybe for, its core curriculum. That is to say, the common intellectual experience it prescribes for all students, regardless of their major. Most have abandoned the core because their faculties can no longer agree on its content. The canon wars of the past generation may have yielded no clear victor, but their aftermath has, I think, enshrined the principle of student choice in satisfying what we call distribution requirements. The problem is, that students are by definition ill-equipped to make an informed choice about their educational needs. And the Common Core responded to that need, typically with some version of a great books curriculum. To suppose that students can rely on their interests to guide their own educational choices forgets that those interests are mediated and stimulated by fads and fashions that ought to be resisted. The old core curricula, various as they may have been, shared the assumption that there are subjects worth knowing for their own sake, that an, education per that an educated person studies many subjects rather than one or a few, and that such learning preserves freedom from the rule of experts by developing the capacity for independent judgment. These, again, are themes that were touched on uh, much better than I, I have by both John and Bill. General education implicitly acknowledged the highest kind of learning was intransitive, oriented towards self-knowledge. Once again, Aristotle provides the essential argument. He writes, it would be strange if a person should not choose the life that is his own, but rather that of something else. And for a human being, this is the life that accords with the intellect, if in fact this especially is an education dominated by career preparation, by contrast, leaves students immersed in the very condition from which they need detachment in order to lead a life. Arguing for the essential non-utilitarian character of liberal learning, Ava Braun has said that it perhaps could not survive if not for the fact that learning undertaken for its own sake, not as a means, but as its own end, turns out to be a means to moderate worldly success as well. But the indicators of such success, she continues, are not the right and finally not even the most persuasive defense of an education to which they remain merely, if happily, incidental. For Braun, the coincidence that learning for its own sake can be morally and practically effective testifies to the fact that our natures are, after all, made for it. But the converse is not true. And to think that liberal learning might be the byproduct of vocational education, provided that the latter is done, quote, in a liberal spirit, unquote, is a profound error. Liberal learning, can, liberal learning cannot aim at, even though it might contribute to, training the good lawyer, doctor, or civil engineer without losing its essential character. The literary critic Henri Pair goes even further, declaring that it is the duty of education in a democracy to, quote, train young people not only for, but also against their future profession or trade. For professionalism is a source of the inability of too many people to enjoy leisure. These considerations, I suggest, further complicate the case for liberal education's public use. Turning to my second point, the logic of liberal education argues for resistance to political imperatives as much, if not more, than to economic ones. Just as genuinely liberal learning steers clear of professional training, it should, enlist, should resist enlistment in the production of useful citizens. For the good citizen is motivated by an allegiance that it 
inevitably uh, truths on critical judgment. In the face of symptoms of deep public disengagement from democratic life, especially among young people, colleges today are busily rebranding liberal education as an education for citizenship. And at first glance, it seems unobjectionable. Citizens ought to understand the principles that inform their founding charters. Our constitutional democracy depends on a sophisticated understanding of the boundaries of justice, demarcating the public and the private spheres. Our pluralistic democracy requires a nuanced appreciation of the character of a people whose culture is political rather than religious or ethnic, and whose shared possession of sovereignty coexists with occasionally deep moral disagreement. The challenges to the preservation of liberal democracy thus seem to call for the very habits of heart and mind that a liberal education presumably instills. But as much as we might wish to make liberal education serve democracy, we should forbear subordinating it even to that worthy goal, subordinating it. The essential incompatibility and li of liberal and civic education is visible, I think, in the most significant argument for civic education available to us, the one made by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson identified the true constitution of the American people not with its political institutions, but with a character-shaping education that would instill Republican principles in their hearts and minds. It is the manner and spirit of a people, he said, which preserves a republic in vigor. Jefferson's educational philosophy is entirely political, and his vision of an education in republicanism and for republicanism is so systematic as to verge on the doctrinaire. In Jefferson's conception, the people are rendered safe by being made fit to govern. Founded as it is on the equality of natural rights, Jefferson's republicanism is oriented toward individual freedom, but his paramount educational concern is immersion in the republican principles that constitute the fence to that freedom. His own philosophical interests and attachment to free thinking notwithstanding, Jefferson trusts only in an education that was, he said, perfectly homogeneous with the manners and morals of the country. His political science depends on the reciprocal influence of institutional and sociological effects. Only a Republican people can remain free, but only a Republican government can make the people Republican. The cause of limited government, then, paradoxically, relies on the unlimited shaping of the public mind. As it happened, this programmatic indoctrination, for the sake of freedom, rested on a hope in the stability of Republican qualities that was thwarted by the inevitable tendencies of a burgeoning commercial republic. The failure of Jefferson's civic vision exposed, I think, a flaw in the proposition that education in and for democracy must be an education by democracy, and opened up the possibility that the survival of liberty might require a different education. And here, I think, Tocqueville is relevant. For he saw the homogeneous education Jeff Jefferson imagined not as a Republican aspiration, but as an inexorable fact of modern democracy. For the latter, Tocqueville says, does not instill beliefs by persuasion. It imposes them and makes them penetrate souls by an immense pressure on the minds of all, on the intellect of each. Democracy homogenizes by making everything more democratic, including revealed religion. Tocqueville might thus have reassured Jefferson of the ultimate reconcilability of religion and republicanism. But the immense pressure of democracy's own dogmatic beliefs on the individual who feels powerless to oppose public opinion pose a new and ever greater threat to liberty than the subservience of traditional believers. The dilemma of modern democracy, then, is its inability to preserve the foundation of freedom against erosion by the principle of equality. As human relations become freer, hierarchies dissolve, social ties become increasingly voluntary or contractual. 
The tendency to equality thus works for and against freedom. On the one hand, the equality of rights is the visible manifestation of our capacity for self-determination, the symbol of our authority over our own actions. On the other hand, the reliance on our own authority inevitably weakens the hold of public and common authorities, like religion. And as a result, individuals feel an increasing isolation from one another. Because liberal democracies, egalitarian, and commercial culture undermines the spirit of liberty, an education for liberal democracy must be an education against it, rowing against its most powerful currents, especially the absorption and the pursuit of material comforts. I'll conclude with this. The defect of Jeffersonian civic education was its lack of awareness that even Republican principles need limits that the principles themselves cannot supply. The countercultural education democracy needs would oppose its constant agitation for wealth and social climbing by cultivating a taste for non-utilitarian reasoning. Democratic individuals, Tocqueville says, give themselves over to meditation with difficulty and naturally have little esteem for it. The democratic social state and institutions bring most men to act continually, yet the habits of mind suited to action are not always suited to thought. The active individual must then rely on ideas that he has not had the leisure to fathom, and the culture generally lacks appreciation for the profound, slow work of the intellect. In these circumstances, he says, a selfish, mercenary, industrial taste for knowledge prevails, and few are animated by a pure desire to know. In our day, Tocqueville concludes, one must detain the human mind in theory. It runs of itself to practice. So if liberal education is to serve democracy, it will best do so unintentionally intangibly by remaining an end in itself, ennobling democracy by resisting its inclination to bending everything to immediate use. Thank you. Let's begin by just thanking our panelists for their excellent papers, uh, very thought-provoking. Um, I'm going to use the theme of interconnectedness, which John Presto raised explicitly in his paper, as a way of creating a kind of framework by which the three papers can be compared and contrasted. I hope this framework will stimulate the conversation. Mr. Gresso suggested a human life devoid of public action is contemptible. Although he did not offer an explicit argument for this conclusion, he suggested such a life is contemptible because it fails to reflect the interconnectedness of all things and of human beings in particular at least within a political order, and perhaps beyond it. He noted that the serious student not only has some awareness of the interconnectedness of things, but also that such a student pursues higher education in order to have these interconnections eliminated more fully. Far from responding to this desire, the various isms that have consumed universities and colleges implicitly or explicitly claim the world is fragmented and disconnected. By so doing, they neither respond to the serious student, nor do they truly educate him. Mr. Russell's discussion of the interconnectedness of things is reminiscent of Socrates' claim in Plato's Mino that all nature is akin. According to Socrates, the fundamental similarity between the human being and all other natural things combined with the human being's capacity to learn means nothing prevents someone who learns one thing only from discovering all things, so long as he's brave and does not grow tired of seeking. While Socrates describes the natural realm as an ordered whole of some kind, however, it is not clear he thinks the best way of life involves political action. Mr. Cullen explores precisely this relationship between the human being and political life through a discussion of Aristotle. As Mr. Cullen notes in his paper, Aristotle's concept of nature undermines or denies the 
the kind of interconnectedness Mr. Abresto describes. When Aristotle speaks of nature, he simply means certain beings, namely natural beings, have ends which they fulfill or reach if they are properly supported. According to Aristotle, one can and should look to these ends or fulfilled states to discover the best way of life for each kind of being. By investigating the human being, he concludes that our defining characteristic is our capacity to think. Hence, the best way of life for us is a life of learning and contemplation. At its peak, this life is private rather than public. Since the excellent or fully actualized human being leads a life that is fundamentally private, he's always somewhat at odds with public life. He lives beyond the political order. If liberal education that Aristotle envisions is to be reconciled with public life, it must be understood as an education for gadflies. That is, it serves to create or to help to create human beings who can benefit the political order precisely because they are at odds with it and have a greater perspective on it than those who are submerged more fully in it. Mr. Cullen ends by reminding us of the Tocqueville's argument that such gadflies are particularly crucial to modern liberal democracy, since this form of regime is especially inclined to produce human beings who lack independence and hence are uncritical of customs and paradigms that are harmful to them and to the health of the political order in which they live. Like Mr. Cullen, or rather like Aristotle as described by Mr. Cullen, Mr. McClay also argues strongly for the importance of liberal education to liberal democracy. However, he does not argue in this paper that the good life and public life are necessarily in tension with each other. Here his argument is similar to Mr. Agresto's. On the other hand, unlike both Mr. Agresto and Mr. Cullen, Mr. McClay makes no explicit mention of nature. It is not clear whether his argument for the importance of liberal arts depends upon a concept of a permanent human nature. Rather, he seems to embrace a kind of motion thesis. He endorses the idea that a leap of progress is not a standing broad jump, but a, quote, running broad jump through where we have been to where we go next, end quote. While acknowledging the value of great books in the Western tradition, he characterizes them as dead, at least in some respect. Quote, by including the dead in the circle of discourse, he says, we enrich the quality of conversation. He then goes on to quote Goethe's Faust, who exhorts us to take our heritage as a task from which to make something of our own. Finally, he suggests liberal education is best conceived as a narrative journey. He adds that this journey must be understood as a homecoming. This homecoming, however, does not seem to uh, uh, mean a return to old ways. Rather, Mr. McClay seems to mean that our moving into our future should rise as if organically from our past. In other words, he seems to suggest liberal education is soul craft, not because it brings us to the completion of our nature, understood as a fixed end, but because it helps us to determine the appropriate next step in our evolution. I will conclude with some observations of my own that might be in line with Mr. McClay's ideas, but for which I do not want to hold him responsible. <laughs> The idea of genealogy or evolution brings us to what I regard as the deepest, most serious problem facing liberal arts today. The philosophic and religious underpinnings of the liberal, liberal arts are tied to the idea that there's such a thing as truth, understood as something eternal and unchanging. This concept of truth yields the notion that human nature is similarly static which in turn brings with it certain ideas of human excellence and the best way of life. The same people who are trying to preserve this tradition, however, believe the doctrine of evolution. To be more clear, they no longer truly or fully believe in their philosophic and religious underpinnings. 
they are suffering from what may be an incurable crisis of faith, broadly understood. This fracture does not mean liberal arts and liberal education is over. It does not necessarily mean we have no future. But it does mean that if they are to survive, we must conceive of a new chapter in our narrative. There is no possibility of a simple return to our past, for we are no longer what we were. This circumstance could be wondrous.
coercion with uncoerced love and, uh, and, and, and freedom. And, 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 uh, that doesn't mean that one abandons uh, you know, the sources of, of one's loyalty, the objects of one's loyalty. I, I think of, uh, it's very corny, but I think quite wonderful, uh, I believe it was Robert Browning, uh, is saying, I could not love thee dear so much, love thy not honor more. And we should hope for a political society in which uh, the, the love of honor, above the love of, of, of the, that, that society of which one is a citizen, uh, uh, should prevail, but also properly understood animate our citizenship. After all, Socrates, yes, was a gadfly, but he also went to his death in obedience to what he understood to be the laws of the city. Uh, it, it administered in a way that most of us regard as scandalous uh, in our time. But uh, uh, I mean, there's two ways of thinking about the issue of the philosopher in the city. And I, I, I think the latter is part of it, too. Uh, in other words, we want to, I think liberal education can create uh, superior citizens uh, precisely because their loyalties are not coerced uh, by a tr prejudice or tradition or by something other than uh, the life reason uh, and uh, the, the art of rational deliberation together in community. So that, that's my minor disagreement with Dan's emphasis. And I have major disagreement. <laughs> uh, first, uh, the first major disagreement is uh, this all the time, and I studied with Alan Moore. Alan Moore was my professor, uh, and I thought Alan was wrong in so many ways. The first way he was wrong is liberal education is not coterminous with philosophy. And if we think of it, if we think that way, we're going to see it as well. Liberal education is this philosophic attempt to be critical of everything, to you know, to find where the to be to be. Will be as as liberal artists, little Socrates is going around biting the bones of everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not the fullness of liberal education. Uh, liberal education is so much richer, so much wider. Uh, uh, even if, to, to pick on Lisa for a second, when I was talking about the public, uh, maybe Witherspoon did have in mind uh, political usefulness, but I want to talk about the public usefulness, and that's far broader than the political. <coughs> That, that liberal education somehow can enrich the culture, not just enrich political life. But mostly, I think it's a question of where you begin looking at liberal education. If you think liberal education is that thing that criticizes, that we go out there and look for uh, uh, what we want to find fault with, if you want to go out there and be little Socrates, or maybe even worse, little Descartes, uh, uh, believe nothing uh, our stuff. Go ahead, do it. Uh, I think rather liberal education would find itself more worthy if instead of saying our job is to criticize, we can by saying our job is to understand. So rather than say, I want to have a critical view of Thomas Jefferson, I would, might be wholly appropriate. Uh, I would first want to understand and ask him the, the basic question. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, I don't understand how you can say that. Please explain it to me. Sympathetic reading rather than critical reading, reading with an eye to understanding rather than reading with an eye to find fault. That's, I think, the difference between us. As I listen to uh, Mr. Resto speak, the thought occurred to me, uh, I want to phrase this correctly. How do you see the influence of social media on the student in our young society and its effect on the disillusionment <coughs> with liberal education? God, I wish I could answer that question. <laughs> uh, uh, let, let me explain yeah, what the problem yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't use Twitter. Right. I can't use Twitter right. because I cannot be limited in my thought by what, 140 characters? It's insanity. 
But this is what influences our young and young up to the age of 35 and 40 now. Society and politics and the media. Why isn't this, in your eyes, one of the major destructive uh, influences on the desire for a new education? And part of my, my problem is my influence. I'm like you. I have no idea what Twitter is. And other people answer this for me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you directed that me, but no one's going to give my answer. <laughs> <laughs> he pays me well to do this. You know, I, I think one, uh, I'm going to be very interested in um, the final talk by Matthew Crawford on attention, because it seems to me that's the way to get at the answer to your question. I, I don't think there's anything intrinsically evil about Twitter or Facebook. Uh, they, they are things that uh, can be put to good uses. But one of the things that we have to understand is that actually we live in a, you know, economics is the study of scarcity, right? Um, and for most of human history, the material scarcity has been uh, the concern of economics. Now we have a question of attention scarcity. And that is, where are we going to direct our attention? It's a finite, Quantity. There's not a lot you can do, despite the word, all the ideas about physical ideas about multitasking. There's not a lot you can do to expand the range for attention. So the question is, what are you going to attend to with the limited resources of time that you have at your disposal? Are you going to spend it going back and forth in social media in this kind of material world, or are you going to use it to tackle uh, the understanding of Aristotle, or Shakespeare, Dante, whatever? Uh, it, it's a zero-sum game, in a sense. I mean, what, what occupies one chunk of time, it's not necessarily following a mathematical formula, but ultimately, uh, there's aggression involved. You know, the good press is pressed out by the bad. Uh, so that's what I worry is about. It's not so much the existence of these things, which are, are quite, can be quite wonderful. And in the hands of people who are more mature than I am, I, I know I go a while if I started using these, so I stay away from them. I stay away from heroin, okay? <laughs> but uh, there are people who are more disciplined uh, and can make use of this and, and incorporate it into their intellectual life. Uh, and uh, maybe in the long run, we'll all be able to do that. But I'm concerned about the economics of attention and where, where your attention is there, your heart is too, to borrow from Jesus. So I, I had a question for the panelists for the final remark of the moderator. Uh, how would you respond to her suggestion, if I understood it correctly, that believing in evolution is in some way at odds with believing in uh, the lasting truths that Homer and other classics might have to offer us? Oh, I think she's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Canons and within the methodological canons of science, it's a very robust uh, explanation for physical and biological change. It doesn't tell you anything about the ultimate things. It doesn't tell you anything about the ways in which we humans make meaning out of the world and whether and how they change. So and they may, and they may, I, I agree with your last with your penultimate sentence. It's beautiful. That we, we, we can't go back because we are not the same. This, but this is a fundamental insight that T.S. Eliot had in his tradition in the individual panel, which I assume the speaker last night talked about, uh, is that we see further than those in the past because they are precisely what we see. So I, I agree with that part. That was a great part of her. <laughs> uh, we have time for one more thing. Yes, thank you. I wanted to ask a variation on the earlier question about conservatism. I was wondering, uh, and this is directed to anyone on the panel, to what extent do you all think that uh, liberal education is tra uh, traditionally conceived and is practiced at St. John's uh, is compatible with uh, the interests, uh, uh, passions of contemporary 21st century political leaders? So, so that's part of to what extent is traditional is liberal education as traditionally conceived compatible with the interests of contemporary political liberalism? I'm thinking particularly, uh, uh, Mr. Gresso, of your brief uh, vivid and I think accurate description of what passes for 
the education of the humanities at many universities and by teachers who are proud of being liberals and announced their students to be liberals.